and we are recording. Um, Mr. Dana Lombardi, thank you for joining us here with the Armchair Dragoons at the Armchair Dragoons Digital Convention in January. And we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to be here. And I'm going to get out of the way and let you take over the show. Great. Thanks, Brian. I, I really am happy to be here and talk about the card game that I designed. Uh, a lot of you may know me from my uh, most famous war game that I designed, which is Streets of Stalingrad, uh, which came out in 1979. And there's been three editions since then. They um, uh, all covered basically tactical company level fighting in the streets of Stalingrad for the city of Stalingrad before the big encirclement when the Soviets counterattacked in November of 1942. Uh, and that game, as I mentioned, is super tactical, super detailed, and literally could take a weekend or several days more uh, to play out the entire game, which people do sometimes at Consum World Expo, which is also called monstergame.com. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a totally different approach, uh, which I decided to do with this card game in conjunction, in partnership with my good friend, Roger McGowan, who's a Hall of Fame graphic artist. And we basically came up with this idea back in 2017 to do a, a I don't want to say simple, but a, an abstract filler game that people could enjoy whether they really are into games, war games in general, or in specifically, uh, or have never seen a war game or historical game. So it was, it was like remembering what I had done when I got into the hobby in the first place, when I played Africa Corps, Waterloo, the early Avalon Hill games, because when you look at the rules books for those things, they were not even rules books, they were like folders, maybe the inside of a box where they had like four pages of rules, including examples. And I wanted to go back to that and see if it was possible to do a game today that would now allow people to have access and, and be able to bring them into playing historical war games without having to read a 48 page rule book. So it started in 2017 uh, and it finally saw fruition with the Kickstarter that I ran this past fall uh, successfully. And I'm very gratified to the, about that. And then Roger and I uh, wanted to do something. It's not a tactical game. It's very important. It's an abstract game about World War I. So let me explain how that came into being. Uh-oh. Is it not letting me go to the next? I don't know why it's not letting me go to the next. Hmm. You just hit the page down on the uh, keyboard there. Yeah, I am. And it's, this is. Is your window live is the other question I would. Oh, that's a good question. And it may not, this is frustrating. Uh, on hang screen. on a second. I may have to do, I have to do this a little bit differently. I have a full screen showing. So ah. let me, let me get out of the full screen. Hmm. Here we go, screen. Oh, that's how I do it. Never mind, I figured it out. So, what happened is I had a big boost in being able to do the research. And that's all of all the historical games require lots and lots of research. And I was very fortunate because uh, in 2017, there was a lot of centennial projects going on for the 100th anniversary of World War I, one of which uh, I got a chance to work on was for the War Memorial uh, Veterans Building. That's the lobby. You see me standing in there with my, my daughter. And those banners on the uh, columns in the back and the ones in front, which you can't see, uh, were part of one of the Miss Centennial projects that I worked on. And it allowed me to basically collect a lot of data and information that helped me put together this game. problem, of course, was, you know, there's so much information is like, well, what do I keep and what do I leave out? Um, but I decided, you know, World War One has so many myths about it and so many things that are misconceptions. But I also wanted to make sure that the battlefield realities, in other words, what really happened was going to be there, you know, was going to be part of it. 
Um, and I decided to start working on the World War I timeline, but I went backwards. I, I decided, you know what, let's look where it ended up and then put that together and then chop it up into scenarios, which are under development um, on the history. But otherwise, what are all the elements that are important to put into something about World War I? And of course, our focus initially is gonna be on the Western Front. And one of the biggest things that people know about World War I or have heard about is that, you know, the British troops called themselves lions led by donkeys, as in the average fighting combat soldiers were the lions that had to do the fi fighting. Uh, and the donkeys were the generals, the commanders who sat back in their chateaus miles and miles away from the front line, uh, making decisions that were totally divorced from reality. Um, but the reality, of course, is that both yes and no, there were donkeys, there was a learning curve that every army had to go through, whether it was the Germans, the Russians, the French, or the Americans when they came in. Um, but where did these myths and impressions about World War I come from? So here's two really important popular misconceptions. One is that were the military commanders who led their nation's armies clueless butchers who were indifferent to the sufferings of their soldiers? And the other one was, was the Great War, which as it was called initially, which became the First World War after the Second World War was, was fought, was the Great War pointless and futile? And the early views of the war in Great Britain were totally opposite this. Sir Douglas Haig, who was later reviled and still is today, was initially a respected hero. He was cheered by thousands when he returned. The streets were named after him in England, Scotland, Canada, and even the United States. He worked on behalf of the British veterans and the Royal British Legion, which is similar to our American Legion, uh, which supports American veterans. And that made him even more popular with the British public. Uh, and there were three equestrian statues were erected to honor him. That's more than Wellington, okay? That's more than Nelson. So you're talking about statues in England were put up to honor Haig. Um, one, however, was moved to a less public place in 2009. And today there are demands to remove another statue claiming it's an insult to Britain's dead of the Great War. So you can see how far down he has fallen in popular esteem um, just in the... Uh, a hundred years after War I, a totally different attitude than from what people thought right after World War I. So what happened? So veterans of that war and historians from then and till today started examining the war in hindsight, which is always done, okay? And some reputations were damaged or tarnished by this. Um, there was a British veteran, Robert Graves, wrote a very famous book, Goodbye to All That, which was a 1929 book and was a 2014 film. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, probably one of the most famous World War I movies ever made, which was uh, a classic 1930 film. Uh, and it showed the war from the German perspective, which was just unheard of. I mean, before this, people didn't even worry about the enemy or, or the other side, what their feelings were, what they went through. And so that was a, um, and of course, it was an anti-war movie, but not as much as, oh, what a lovely war in 1969, which was really anti-war. And the reason all this came together and was emphasized, and we still have an anti-war legacy today, is because of the Vietnam War era that was, you know, a huge opposition during the war and then failed miserably. Um, and we pulled out of it. And it's still a huge scar that Americans live with today because we have so many veterans who went through that period. So the other part of it was that Lloyd George, who was the prime minister during the war and the last part of the war, he wrote memoirs. And like a lot of politicians, it, it wasn't just one book, it was six volumes between 1933 and 36. And George accused Haig of criminal incompetence, that's in print, that resulted in the needless slaughter of thousands of British soldiers in 1917 while bringing the Allies no closer to victory. That is just devastating. And boy, once both Graves' book and George's uh, volumes were published, it just opened a floodgates of constant criticism and basically hindsight critiques of Haig and primarily the British uh, generals, but it, it slopped over in everybody. All the, all the generals got tarnished by this, no matter what nation they were with. 
I have a couple of uh, three books I'd like to recommend because I think it's really important that if somebody wants to study more about World War I, you know, it's like, where do you start? What do you get? Um, and three of these books were really, really instrumental by incredibly good historians. This one by Dennis Showalter, who sadly died in 29, at the end of 2019, um, Instrument of War is about the German army. Why is this important? The German army was the main thing that fought. East Front, Italy, uh, West Front, uh, everywhere except throughout the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Germany in general also was the main threat on the, uh, on the oceans, uh, particularly with their submarines. So understanding how the Germans were able to pull this off, how one nation, even though it was bigger than France, uh, was still outnumbered by the Allies, <clears throat> there were like 30 some allied nations against Germany, which only had Austro-Hungary uh, and uh, the ba uh, Bulgarians and Ottoman Empire on it, that side. And Germany basically carried them. So understanding how the Germans thought and how they were able to, almost able to pull this off is really important. And this book is a great read and helps you understand uh, who the enemy was and why they were able to do as well as they did in World War I. Another book um, which won a Tomlinson Award, the previous one did, and this one, Tomlinson Awards are the awards given out each year to the best books in English on World War I. Um, General da uh, David Zabecki um, is an American, uh, really, really talented writer and editor has done over 30 books. And this one called The General's War studied um, how World War I ended in 1918. It's incredibly good professional campaign study. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically quote from him uh, several parts through this, uh, pro this uh, presentation <clears throat> so you understand why it's so important. Uh, and then finally, just out, literally, I received it in December, <clears throat> Zabecki uh, and Mastriano put out Pershing's Lieutenants. And Pershing Lieutenants is very similar. If you've ever read Lee's Lieutenants, there are similar books about um, Eisenhower's Lieutenants in World War II, uh, Churchill's uh, Lieutenants in World War II. Uh, this is really a super important book and tells you about the big names and the lesser known names who basically put together an American army on the fly very quickly um, got into combat a year after the first troops got over there to France in, 20, in 1917 and, and how they were able to perform and do as well as they did and become the army that would eventually help win World War II. So here's Zabecki. He rejects the simplistic butchers and bunglers view that uh, was donkeys. Uh, and here are three of the quotes that I, I want to read that are really important. World War I was a war unlike any other ever fought. It was a war of future shock. Newly emerging technologies and weaponry, communications, and later mobility rendered all the old tactics and mechanics of war fighting obsolete. All the past experience, doctrine, and theory no longer worked. And I want to just add that everyone made mistakes. The Germans screwed up. The Russians screwed up, the French, the British, the Americans, when they got into it, everyone made mistakes because they had no experience and nothing to go with to help them figure out until they actually started fighting. And it was a huge slap in the face when they found out, oh my God, this is like, it's all about firepower. It's all about, you know, trying to keep your troops from getting slaughtered. You can't just stand up in rows of men anymore and shoot it out. And World War I, despite the fact that people say it was pointless, they were locked into a uh, static trench warfare, that's not true. In World War I, the Central Powers had offensives in the East that captured large areas of Poland, Russia, the Baltic states, overran Serbia, and crushed Romania in a few weeks. This all happened in World War I. These, this is like World War II type you know, advances and, um, and basically uh, offensives that were very positive and worked for the Germans. Uh, but again, because it's the Eastern Front, a lot of people just disregard it. Everything's like Western Front, British, you know, and it's not working over there. Italy was effectively knocked out of the war by the German and Austro-Hungarian offensive at Troparetto in 1917. 
I mean, they were still in the war technically, but they, unless they got massive help from the British, the French, and then even the Americans sent troops down there, they were done. So what happened on the Western Front is that the troop density and the defense in depth and the parity and the quality and quantity of the opposing armies meant that breakthroughs of the trench lines on the Western Front was not possible before 1918. Unlike the Eastern Front, where there was huge areas not as densely uh, packed with troops and not as much dense, um, you know, depth of uh, trench defenses. And this other thing about the guys, Jato generals sitting back, you know, miles and miles behind the lines, this is just the generals killed in battle between 1914 and 1918. And I want you to realize that the French had the largest length of line of trenches on the Western Front. The British was much smaller. The Germans also not only had a huge, the almost the, well, they did have the entire Western Front, but they also had half of the Eastern Front they had to contend with. So when you look at this, 78 British generals were killed and 300 wounded, okay? 78, that's more than what the French lost for a much smaller area of the front on the Western Front. So these guys were definitely brave, physically brave, even if they were clueless in some things like all the generals were. And you can see the difference. So this is not where these guys are hiding and letting all the troops below them take the casualties. And the other thing that Zepek is trying to point out, which I agree with completely, is that the senior military leaders on all sides, including the Germans, spent most of the first three years of the war trying to keep up with and come to terms with the new technologies, how most effectively to use them and how best to counter them in the hands of the enemy. Unfortunately, when you are in the middle of a fighting a war, trial and error is the only viable mechanism to learn this new way of warfare. That's why it was so expensive, not just in treasure that all these nations spent because manufacturing modern weapons and huge quantities was going to be so costly, but it's costly in human lives as well, not just dead, but also wounded. I'll talk about that just a little bit later. So here's the Battle of Verdun, which, is, which lasted for 11 months. And uh, Brigadier General Robert Doughty, whose book is the book in French, I mean, excuse me, on the French army in English, uh, wrote Pyrrhic Victory. And in that, he noted that the French suffered fewer casualties. That's over 11 months. Fewer casualties at Verdun and this, their part of the Somme than they did in the bungled operations of 1914 or the incessant offensives of 1915. In just a few months of 1914, the French lost 330,000 killed because they ran straight into German machine guns and artillery with old tactics. Well, they stopped doing that. By 1916, the French said no more of that. And they basically fought the Battle of Verdun much more efficiently, both in terms of casualties and in terms of the equipment and um, weapons used. So the Western Front, the last two years of the war, the French army mutinied in the spring of 1917. It was a disaster because the constant warfare, remember the, the French were on the offensive in Verdun. They were just holding ground, but they were taking casualties. And it was just Here's another year gone from 14, 15, 16, and 17. The Germans still have most of the territory in France that they captured. It doesn't look like it's going to end. And after Verdun, their new commander, who basically led them into a, a pointless attack that went nowhere, they said, that's enough. We're done. We're finished. We don't, we don't have faith in our leaders anymore. We don't, have, we don't trust our commanders. We don't trust our tactics. And Peyton came in to rescue the situation and basically said, we are going to wait for the tanks and the Americans because by that time, American, America had declared war. And so the only way to keep the French troops fighting, at least defensively, was to say, that's it. We're not going to put you in, we're not going to waste your, your lives anymore. The American expeditionary forces started to arrive in real big numbers. And by early 1918, 1.7 million boots on the ground were in France. Uh, but in 1917, the, the offensive that um, Prime Minister Lloyd George was so angry at Hague about was at Passchendaele. 
which again failed to break through German defenses. Um, and Prime Minister Lloyd George said in his memoirs that he tried to prevent the attack. And then of course he condemned it and said Haig was basically a butcher for even trying it. Um, the most important thing is to remember that although there's a, this material level of losses and casualties and you know people fighting, morale as Napoleon said, is worth three times what the actual reality of a situation is, which meant that the French army mutinies was a collapse in morale. The British army basically just gutted itself and the men had been, and they were losing faith in their commanders in 1918. So that when the Americans arrived, they were just shocked at how defeatist their French allies and the British soldiers were, not the officers who were basically saying, everything's wonderful and we'll teach you and we'll command you. Um, but they were just surprised about how low the morale was on both the French and the British armies when they got to France. Now here's, a, I'm gonna use some cards in the game just to highlight the stuff so you can see what's in the game. But the two big guys, uh, commanders on the German side, 1918, were Paul van Hindenburg and Erich von Ludendorff. Basically these guys were the team that put together the victory at Tannenberg in 1914. In 1914, the Germans gambled. They sent everything against the French and left one small army in East Prussia to hold back the Russians, which of course didn't work because the Russians got uh, able to launch their offensive much sooner with more troops than the Germans calculated. Oops, and the Germans didn't have a plan B. So they sent a couple of corps from the West from France, which never got there in time, but they sent these two guys to the East to take over from the guy who was the commander of the Eighth Army and whose morale was shot. And they beat the Russians and Tannenberg, which was one of the most important battles of World War I. Uh, again, it's an Eastern Front battle. Um, and these guys became huge heroes in Germany and they got more and more success on the Eastern Front uh, because in addition to Tannenberg, I pointed out their success at capturing most of Poland, knocking um, Serbia and Romania after, out of the war. Uh, and eventually in 1918, when they figured we need to do something on the Western Front, they sent these guys to um, the um, uh, Western Front in order to defeat the French and the British before the Americans arrived in force. Okay, so how do they do this? The German army worked differently from the Allies, and this is how that can, can be shown. <clears throat> Again, this is Zebecki who is explaining this. The staff, the staff of, of officers who worked under Ludendorff. Lorendorf was the commander, basically, of the German army, but they called him the chief of staff, okay? So Ludendorff identified various possible ends and developed it and, and the, the, what he wanted to do, but the staff decided what it was going to be. They came up with a list of possible ending situations and what the courses of action would be to get to those ending uh, situations. <clears throat> and then they presented their final recommendation, the staff's recommendation to the commander, to Lordendorf. And you know, it's basically, here's a laundry list, A, B, C, D, pick the one you want. And so that's why it went the way it did. And I'll explain that when we show the maps a little later, but basically, it's a bottom up planning force, okay? Not a top down, which is the opposite of the allies, especially in World War II, uh, and I'll show that next. So the allied army in 1918 finally had a commander in chief, a commander over all the allied armies in France, and that was Ferdinand Foch. And the French army under him was under Henri Pétain, who ended up being basically a really making a bad decision, working with Vichy France in World War II, um, who was condemned, condemned to death um, by de Gaulle and the French. So this man who did a tremendous job at uh, Verdun and helped lead the French army to victory in World War I, didn't matter, bad mistake in World War II, just got rid of this guy as, as a uh, hero in France. Allied army in 1918 also considered consisted of the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, under Douglas Haig. Now, 
this is really interesting because the British had already developed the elements of combined arms as early as 1916. They started with a rolling barrage, which was artillery closely coordinated with infantry, not a big barrage and then send the guys out, but the infantry would follow behind a rolling barrage of artillery. There were also tactics for small units attacking between strong points. This is the German, you know, Sturm Troop thing that was going to happen in 1918, but the British already figured that out. And light machine guns, in other words, machine guns that the infantry could carry with them, and lots of grenades to be thrown into the trenches to take positions. There were also aircraft reconnaissance support, really well developed. So the, the guys coming back with the photos, they could identify where the strong points were, where the artillery was, and they could target those. And they also had developed tanks by 1916 and employed them. Yes, there were mistakes. Yes, it didn't always work. But why didn't they put all these together and have that work before 1918 like it did at the end of the war? And as one simple reason, the officer class, the upper class, was anti-intellectual and anti-modern. There was a strict segregation of that upper class and of the officers from the working class enlisted men. And this General Knox, one of the British generals, this sums it up. He looked at the working class enlisted guys as a physically deteriorated race of town bred humanity. This is contemptuous of their own soldiers and they couldn't be trusted to do any kind of innovation or to have um, you know, spontaneous ideas or to basically take initiative on their own. It was like, sit tight, defend until an officer tells you what to do, which is why they simply could not get their act together and use all those elements until 1918. Now, there, um, when the Americans got there, the American Expeditionary Forces uh, were under John Pershing. And then, and this, this is really, really an, unusual. You have to realize how unprecedented this is. The previous generals in the Russian army, the British army, the German army, and the French army, all the armies basically, they stuck with guys for a long time and it took a lot to get rid of them because they're the upper class. They're the guys running things in the society as well as in the army. So Pershing comes in, he really doesn't have anything more as experience other than chasing, you know, Pancho Villa in Mexico. And on that basis, they give him command of the American Expeditionary Forces. And then he starts off with an, a supposition that trench warfare doesn't work. We're going to use rifle and bayonet. And we're going to get out of these and overwhelm the enemy. Um, of course, that's not going to work. Total failure. And this is what's so unusual, though. Pershing realizes he doesn't have the answer. He has no clue on how to make it happen. So he talks to his subordinates, of which Hunter Liggett is probably one of the most advanced intellectuals. That's And Hunter Liggett said, this is the way we need to do it. And so Pershing kicks himself upstairs. Hunter Liggett takes over command of the first army, which Pershing was running. Now, Pershing, of course, can't keep his nose out of it. And Hunter Liggett finally tells him to get out of his office, out of the headquarters, so he can get on with running the, uh, the campaign. But for the first, you know, I guess five weeks of the nine weeks that America fought at the end of 1918, um, that was a disaster. You know, this bayonet and rifle fire just wasn't working and Pershing recognized it quickly. It didn't take months, it didn't take years. And he said, Liggett, take over, do what you think is best. Now there were allied armies working under the British, the Canadians and the Anzacs, who basically were known as shock troops by the Germans. And these guys had figured out all that combined arms stuff that the British had developed, these guys embraced. The reason they're shock troops is because they made it work. Now, they weren't given permission to do so until 1918, but every time they could sneak in doing a well-planned, well-coordinated operation, they took their objectives. 1917, Passchendaele was a disaster, except for Curry and the Canadians who took Vimy Ridge without very many casualties. Total success. And John Monash uh, also 
his Australians, his Anzacs, had a great reputation, and they got along, of course, not only with the British, but they got along with the uh, the Americans, who were more like them. You have to understand, these two guys were not upper class. They were they were respected men in their societies, but neither one was a professional military soldier. I mean, they belonged to the militia, which is more like a social club, but in terms of military training, these guys had basically none before World War I. And their first commands were brigades, brigade leaders, because they were given that. And Curry learned about the Western Front fighting because he was in the Germans' first use of gas on the Western Front. And so he was introduced to it and he had to learn quickly. Monash basically commanded a brigade at Gallipoli. And again, he learned on the job. Both these guys figured out, again, they're businessmen. I mean, Curry sold real estate before the war and Monash was a civil engineer. Neither one was a military guy. So they came from it, from studying the war and figuring out how to make this work much differently. Whereas the British were top down and never would even talk to somebody of a certain level, you know, except maybe a sergeant to give orders, to, but they wouldn't even discuss things with privates. These guys would get information from anybody, whoever had a good idea, whoever had been out there and seen the actual fighting and saw the German positions, they incorporated that into their plans. And they also talked from as high up as the generals down to the uh, uh, lower level officers and probably sergeants as well about what their responsibilities were and what they expected them to do, which is why their operations earned them the, con the consideration of being called shock troops by the Germans. So the Allied Army in 1918 was basically command-centric, top-down. The commander, Foch, told his staff what his intent was, and the, in the end, he wanted to achieve and stated any constraints. And it, basically, I want all the armies to move forward, uh, just like Eisenhower is going to do with the broad front strategy in, um, in World War II. The staff then worked out various course of action options and presented the results to the commander who would then choose which one he wanted. But they were basically doing what their commander wanted them to do, opposite of Ludendorff, okay? And this is going to go well for Foch and not go well for Ludendorff. So the German offensive in 1918, um, you can see, I hope you can see that there's a, it's basically a giant overrunning uh, between the British Fifth Army and the French Army to its south. The, the British Fr uh, Fifth Army is basically going to be erased, knocked out, gone, done. And the Third Army is going to get trashed. But initially, the Fifth Army is all but destroyed. It's just <clears throat> an amazing uh, achievement by the Germans in 1918, which had not been done on the Western Front until that phase. And then the second thing is that the German offensive then goes after the, if the British around the second army uh, above uh, Ear, Eeps, Wipers as the, as the British call it. Um, and you notice a couple of things here. Number one, and there's one more, I need one more in here. Uh, yes, and there's the German offensive. And then they go back down south again. And you can see that they're also pushing back up through the British third army. They're all over the map. We'll push here and then we'll push there and then we'll push back here again. It's like, it, there's no coordination. There's like, what's the objective? Where are you trying to go? And switching these troops back and forth is not only difficult to do, but logistically it's just, it's a mess. And so the Germans just waste their effort against the, the um, uh, trying to break through in areas where they trash who's immediately in front of them, but Foch is throwing in their reserves to keep the Germans from breaking all the way through and collapsing the entire front. But uh, the Germans now have expended their, their best troops, the, all the guys that have been transferred from the Eastern Front to the Western Front to knock out the British and French before the Americans get uh, involved, that's failed. Total failed. A million German soldiers go from the east to the west, and they're thrown away in these pointless, disconnected, you know, attacks that don't even work together. And so the Germans have spent, they've just spent their effort uh, to really no effect. So the counteroffensive are 
they, they decide, Frosch decides, okay, they run out of gas, it's our turn. And so the initial attacks happen um, be, from the, uh, the British, which by the way, the, the Anzacs, Monash, and the Canadians under Curry, they're the, uh, the lead force, obviously. And there are also a couple American divisions up there with the British that we don't uh, talk about a lot, but basically it wasn't an all British offensive. It was an American Anzac Canadian offensive um, under the British commanders. And the third army commander, the British uh, com third army commander decided that maybe what we ought to do is take a look at how the Anzacs and Canadians are doing it. And so they actually trained, they practiced all of the tactics needed to coordinate tanks, aircraft, small units uh, and artillery fire to grab territory. And guess what? Ta-da! After years, they were able to pull it off. In August, uh, which Ludendorff called the Black Day of the German Army, it's over because they're pushing back over a devastated area that's been fought over back and forth. There's nothing really for the Germans to defend. And then finally, the push comes from everybody, the Americans, the French, the British, uh, the Belgians, um, and Germany is is done. They're done. And uh, probably the most intelligent thing and very clever thing that Hindenburg did is he recognizes that Ludendorff has basically blown it. They're going to lose the war. And so Hindenburg, instead of waiting for the entire collapse and the allies to get into Germany, decides we accept Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson's 16 points. And it was like, oh no. The French and the British are livid because America wasn't an official ally. They were a co-belligerent. In other words, Wilson could make his own peace. He did not have to uh, get his allies to agree. And so Hindenburg, in a brilliant political maneuver, decides to accept the, Germ the um, American terms for uh, an armistice uh, and that leaves the British and the French basically going, they had no, no choice because they're not going to fight the war on their own without the Americans. The America, if Woodrow Wilson pulls out the Americans, um, they're done. And, and basically, it's just exhaustion on a front that's not going to go anywhere. That was just brilliant on Hindenburg's part, which may be also part of the reason why Hindenburg was so well liked is because Germany did not have to suffer its, its land, its country being overrun as the uh, Russians did, as France did, um, and as uh, Germany did, obviously, in World War II. So here's how uh, Ludendorff failed. This is Zabecki's, um, remember, Zabecki is a professional military uh, soldier who has experience in operations and actually has done this stuff, okay? So when, when he says things like this, it's not just as a historian, but as somebody who recognizes how armies work. So. I'll just go down this list with you really quick. So Ludendorff focused exclusively on the tactics and did not look at operational concept behind what was Operation Michael, which by the way, is also going to be a failing of the Germans in World War II. Ludendorff also failed to weigh the main effort by allocating too many divisions and too much artillery to the 18th Army's tertiary attack. The 18th Army was like going somewhere else. And it's like, why are you even having them attack? What's the point? And then he violated the principle of unity of command by putting two army groups over three armies, okay? Two army groups, two main commanders are trying to coordinate between them three field armies. It, it makes no sense at all. Why, were, they, were there some political reason why they had to share this? It's just, it's just stupid. Without having a sufficiently superior force ratio, he tried to conduct a force on force battle. In other words, he was still outnumbered on the Western Front, but he didn't try to get a local superiority. He ignored the critical vulnerability of the BES Fragile Logistics Network, designating the Amiens Rail Center as an objective only as an afterthought. It should have been the primary thing. If you grab the rail center, the BEF can't push its, its troops and supplies forward. Why that wasn't brought up by his staff, I have no idea. But this could also be a weakness, someone could say, uh, that in World War II, the Germans also still seem to ignore the importance of logistics. 
And Ludendorff also more than once tried to change the scheme man maneuver during the course of the action. And when such shifts are difficult, if not impossible, with very large scale operations. Yeah, it was totally divorced from reality. So he was a good tactical commander who understood tactics, but he was way out of his depth as a commander over army groups. And then finally, as the battle progressed, his forces diverged rather than converged. I showed you the, those three maps. You know, they attack this way, then they attack in the north, then they come back and attack in the south. Those are not coordinated. They're not diverging together to maximize their, their ability of uh, numbers and, and power and firepower. It, they're just basically going here and there and the other place. By comparison, Foch was able to do everything right. He made Peyton and Haig coordinate in March of 1918 to stop the Germans. They had no choice. He stood over them and said, you will do this or I'll find somebody who will. He never abandoned the principle of a contiguous British-French front, okay? This is important. This is when the Germans are kicking everybody's butt and the Americans haven't yet taken over a portion of the front. He also made crucial decision to launch the counteroffensive on 18 July. Someone had to figure out when is going to when is it going to be the perfect timing, and he estimated correctly the Germans had just spent their bolt. They were done by July, which is why the August counterattacks uh, did as well as they did. And then in uh, in July, he directed uh, Haig, Peyton, and Pershing. Uh, and basically established the operational blueprint for the final Allied general offensive, much like Eisenhower's broad front approach offensive in World War II. He was also very careful to husband his strategic reserve. Reserves are what it's all about. When can you put fresh troops in? When can you put in guys who haven't yet been exhausted and basically you know, worn out by uh, attacking? He pushed the Allied governments to provide necessary forces, and he used his own reserve as sparingly as possible while never losing sight of where the German reserves were. Remember all that photo reconnaissance? Well, you can't hide large forces of troops. And so as a result, um, he was able to figure out where the Germans were, and he made sure that he still had enough reserve when they finally, the Allies finally had counterattacked in 1918. And then finally, he maintained a laser-like focus on the lines of communications, understanding that he had to free the Allied lines and then attack the German lines of communication. So Foch did everything right. Um, and again, this is on a grand strategic level. This is on the level of the card game sees uh, abstractly. And so we, America, won the war. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but there are people that actually say that today. But what happened is that America ended up being the big winner, different from being the, who, the country that won the war, because Liggett, under Pershing, led the US Army to battlefield victory, applying lessons learned in weeks, weeks, rather than months or years like the British. The lessons learned by the US Army were studied and written in a doctrine that helped it win World War II. Very, very important. If we hadn't fought World War I, World War II would have been very, very different. America became the most powerful economic and industrial country in the world. And then we refused to help run the League of Nations and retreated into isolation. So strategically, didn't help us. It helped our army. Our army was really great in great shape after World War I in terms of doctrine and lessons learned. Um, but strategically, we basically said, hell with the rest of the world. And that's the way it was. So the game, the game that I designed uh, with the help of Roger and, so, and Mark Kazmarek, who's a really good game developer, it covers, as you see, these cards are representations of symmetric warfare, traditional warfare, uh, infantry, asymmetric warfare, which came in with, who wrote the book, uh, Lawrence of Arabia on irregular warfare, uh, new technologies, the ace, um, the appropriately is uh, fighter ace, but airplanes played a huge role and a bigger role uh, in World War I and World War II. So those new technologies had to be developed and figured out how in the world are we going to use this? And then improved doctrine by 1918, improved doctrine was combined arms, being able to use different aspects of the weapons in ways that were more effective. And then of course, force multipliers, artillery had gotten huge, just enormously powerful, both in terms of the size of the cannon, the range 
and the number of shells used, which made the, the trench lines even vulnerable, but made the battlefield the really deadly, deadly battlefield. And then um, there were also espionage and sabotage and other factors, which is represented by <coughs> Matahari and other spies in World War I. Uh, and so the game does cover these things in an abstract way. And then you have to figure out, well, how do I use these to win the turn and win enough turns to win the game? And then here's an example of what's on the cards. As I said, there, there are two complete decks of regular playing cards with ace through uh, king, queen, jack, uh, and, and two through 10, and the suits of uh, diamonds, hearts, clubs, and spades, which means you can play, you can use the cards to play any kind of traditional card game like poker, solitaire, whatever. But for the game that Roger and I put together, um, you look at the national insignia, you look at the, um, uh, icons, which in this case, that X means it cancels an enemy. You can see at the bottom, it cancels any one aviation card. Uh, it's an aviation card because you can see from the airplane, <clears throat> it's, it's points, it's point value in the game is 13, that circle in the bottom left. And so it's a really simple way to look at the war. Yes, it's, it's abstract, but it also is easy for anyone to understand and pick up quickly. And then here's other some um, cards that are in the game. These are artillery, which, as I said, got really, really big and important. Um, just to give you an idea of how machine guns and, and cannon changed firepower. In 1918, the, the American 78th Division, Infantry Division, received 1,400 replacements on the 14th of October, right during their final offensive, the Muis Argonne Offensive. And Two days after these 1,400 replacements were put in the line with the 78th Division, 80% of them were casualties. These casualty rates were way higher than the American Civil War. Yes, there were units in the American Civil War that lost 70%, 80%, but that was rare, very rare. In World War I, that was standard. 80%, 90% losses were, were typical. And it was just horrendous compared to previous wars. So the Kickstarter succeeded in December and there will be a pre-sale store for anyone interested that will be open soon. And then finally, here's a few more cards. As you can see, anti-aircraft, tanks, heavy machine guns. Uh, Matahari, as I mentioned me again, I just put her on there because I think it's such a cool card. Um, but you can go to my website, lombardistudios.com which I encourage everyone to look at, not only this game, but other games that I'm working on and books that I have available. Or you can contact me at dana.lombardi at gmail.com and say, hey, Dana, let me know when the presale store is open and I will let you know as soon as it's possible to buy the card game at the same price as the Kickstarter offering. After that, once it's out, it'll be a little bit higher. So it's an opportunity to get the game at that point. And that is it. I wish I had an applause sounder lined up to go ahead and clap for you. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not quite that on the ball. So um, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I hope, that, talk I hope it's entertaining. I hope uh, that uh, people get a good feel for World War I um, and, and how I approach the card game from this. Yeah. So I, I do have a couple of questions for you. And, and, if folks have questions out there in the audience, you want to stack them up in the chat, we'll get them read so that they get captured on the video uh, because the, the video that we're recording of this presentation isn't going to include the chat comments. So we, we got to read those out loud to make sure they get on there. Right. But I, I have two questions for you. One of them kind of leads in with a bit of a comment. Um, but the, the first one, perhaps the easier one, I'm not sure there you attacked a whole bunch of different myths of World War I that, that seem to be caught up in the popular consciousness. And it's, it's great to see those sort of taken apart a little bit. But one of the things that I think uh, ends up happening here in the U.S. a little bit with regards to World War I is while people see it a bit as the prequel to World War II that, that military folks would definitely recognize it as, how do you think people see World War I from a, a political viewpoint in that 
oh, well, of course we fought the Germans in World War I. We fought them in World War II also, that it was just somehow the, the Germans in World War I still get rolled up in just being a junior version of the Germans in World War II, when in fact, I think they were fairly significantly different in a lot of ways. What are your thoughts on sort of the way people see that? That that's excellent. That you you're you're dead on on all of those points, um, Brant. And I I want to want to say something that um, people in Washington D.C. today really don't care about the past. They want to know what do we have to know to make policy. Okay, and Gene Fax, who uh, is a historian and somebody that I respect completely on on his ideas of World War One, when he talks to people in Washington D.C. right now, not just military guys but political leaders. They want to know what the policy should be. And he said, what World War I shows is that no matter how much you try and prepare, you're going to get surprised. Everyone's going to be surprised. Whatever you thought the war was going to be like, whatever you thought combat was going to be like, it, it just doesn't start that way. And you get a slap in the face. And so therefore, what you have to do is figure out how do we adjust? How do we develop our tactics, our, our operations to be faster than the other guy, the old OODA loop, you know, in terms of being able to get inside the other guy's thinking um, so that you can basically force your will on the other side, that you can win because whatever it was you thought was going to start isn't just going to happen. And you're right. World War I was not like World War II. And the guys who basically who ran World War II, Hitler, who was a soldier, Churchill was both a soldier and a, pol and a politician in World War I, um, you know, Marshall and everybody else who basically were low level uh, politicians or um, soldiers, like um, uh, basically um, whether it was Eisenhower and Patton, who were both low level officers, I think majors, um, became major commanding officers in World War II, and they were determined they didn't want to do it like World War I. They weren't going to do the losses. Ironically, you know, World War II was much more costly in casualties, but I think what's important is that um, in terms of the territory taken per casualties expended, it was much more efficient, if you can say that about human life. Um, but the, the fact is that they wanted to try and do something different. They did not want to repeat World War II. So World War I was very important to all of them on both on every side in terms of World War II. And um, let's see, you, you talked about uh, the the doctrine, what the surprise was. Uh, there was one more thing. What did you? What was the third part of your question? Just the issue of sort of the the political viewpoint here in the U.S. that. That World War One, the, the Germans in World War One were essentially sort of the junior Nazis, when in fact the Nazis didn't even exist at that time, really, as as we conceptualize them for World War Two, and and obviously what happened in World War One um, gave rise to what became the Nazi movement in World War Two in in Germany. But I think a lot of Americans, especially in the pop culture and folks that don't know history very well at all just see World War I as, oh yeah, we beat up the Nazis once, then we had to go back and do it again. And, yeah, and well, it was part, yeah, exactly, part two. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think that the way that uh, history is taught in general um, really cares about the reality. In other words, whether, uh, let's just say that the social history that people are trying to present often takes back seat to the political agendas that people want to present. So if you want to believe that, you know, the myths of America, you know, winning the American Revolution all on its own is the way you want to believe it, you're going to believe it, even though without the French, there is no United States of America, okay? Um, and if you want to believe that America won World War I all by itself, you're going to believe that, even though, of course, it's like arguing which leg on a three-legged stool supports the stool because it took the French, the Canadians, you know, the, and the British and everyone in order to defeat the Germans, which is really the most important lesson because it took a huge, coalition warfare can work. Eventually it defeated Napoleon after like 15 years, okay? Um, and it eventually defeated Germany. So, you know, there's several lessons to be learned. Coalitions are better, but can be messy, okay, in general. Um, you'll get surprised and, and have your ass kicked initially, 
And if you live, figure it out and listen to both the people at the bottom, very important, and not just talk to the people at the top, then you have a better chance to adjust and basically innovate and adapt than, uh, than to just listening to your buddies in the social club. Yeah. Um, incidentally, my first duty station when I was on active duty was at Fort Hunter Liggett out in California. There you go. There you go. Yeah. That guy deserves probably, a base yeah. name, doesn't he? He <laughs> definitely deserves it. Yeah. Mo most people probably don't even know it exists. Exactly. It, uh, it the Army <laughs> exactly. Reserve now. Yeah. Yep. So, um, uh, guys in the audience, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat so we can get them in there. Um, the, the other question that I was going to ask while we wait to see if somebody else throws something in here. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, I had written a column for strategy page that uh, seemed to upset a couple people's apple carts. They, they got really upset with me about it. And, and it was essentially, um, it, this was around the time that McGregor's, Douglas McGregor's ideas around the revolution of military affairs with sort of the, uh, the, the information revolution making its way into operational and tactical level combat, not just at the strategic level. Uh, the Army was starting to kind of rearrange some things along those lines, along some of the ideas that McGregor had proposed back in the mid-90s. And everybody was talking about the revolution in military affairs. And, and, and I had argued that really the last significant revolution in military affairs we had was right around World War I. And the argument was this, uh, up until World War I, with a few rare exceptions of, of a couple of siege guns trying to lob rounds over castle walls here and there, up until World War I, warfare was a two-dimensional exercise. World War I was the point at which warfare went three-dimensional, full-time, all the time, across the spectrum, in that you now had aviation, you now had reliable communications that could allow artillery to accurately fire non-line of sight. You now had naval aviation. You now had submarines. You now weren't fighting on a flat plane anymore. What mattered was you had to look up. You had to look down. You had to actually fight and think in three dimensions. And that World War I was the point at which we really saw that change propagate across the world instead of just isolated cases here and there curious what your thoughts might be on that and, uh, and, and how that might have changed um, some of those viewpoints that you mentioned early on. You had folks that were, were not very forward looking, especially in the British Army. I, I have to say, Brant, that I agree with you 100%. I mean, you're, at, you're dead on on everything you just mentioned. Plus, I would add, <clears throat> it was a huge revolution in communications, okay? I mean, you don't have guys just running, riding horses, delivering messages, although they did that. They had, in fact, Hitler was one of those um, runners that ran between the trenches with messages when the telephone lines got cut or for whatever reason, the radios weren't working, um, but they used pigeons, uh, they used radios. And then when you had radios, guess what? Now you've got intercept, you've got cyber warfare where you're trying to decode what the enemy is saying. Sometimes they say it in, in plain uh, their, their language, Russian or German or whatever, because they don't have time to decode it. Um, or there's a code that you have to break as the British did uh, of the German naval code, which made a huge difference. Those things didn't have the impact. Yes, there were spies before that. There were spies in every war, but they didn't have the fast impact or the immediate battlefield impact as those, uh, as that cyber warfare, as those communications did, both positive and negative, uh, during World War One, and and from this point, and from that point till this day. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. Um, I, I'm not seeing any other, well, hold on, here we go. We've got a question coming up here. Um, and, and this may have been something that you covered earlier, uh, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey's asking uh, that the game seems to be from the cards that you've shown and some of the things you talked about, uh, heavily focused on the Western front, plans to expand it into other fronts. Um, also love the planned expansion to use the same era and system for War of the Worlds, but any idea when that expansion is due to come out? Yes. Okay. So if you go to the Kickstarter, if you go to Kickstarter and you look up McGowan and Lombardi's The Great War, or you just put in my name, you can you can read 
everything. You can have ex examples of the cards. Uh, it'll tell you, you can go onto my website and download the rules, sample cards, uh, the glossary, examples of play, uh, the War of the Worlds expansion, which basically adds on to, in other words, the war is the war is being fought and the Martians arrive. Uh oh, who are these guys and what are they doing? And basically, you have to figure out whether you're going to cooperate against the Martians, cooperate with your enemies to fight the Martians, or you all get get a, a major hit because the Martians are doing their thing, trying to destroy, you know, Earth uh, while you guys are busy trying to kill each other. So that's how the Martian expansion, the War of the Worlds expansion works. Uh, and I just want to like to say something. Why would you put that into the game? I, I really love history, but I also love science fiction. And there is a direct connection between World War I and the War of the Worlds. As everyone knows, H.G. Wells was alive in World War I. And he wrote, he was a, a columnist, a journalist, a commenter. Um, he'd be like an influencer today on the internet, but he was an influencer then, but he wrote a, a number of science fiction works that are famous, uh, War of the Worlds being one of the big ones, uh, obviously uh, The Time Machine and several others as well, but War of the Worlds hypothesizes just before World War I that the Martians invade, and so I thought, you know, that'd be really clever to tie in a historical work of science fiction that really and and H.G. Wells, along with Jules Verne's, are probably known as the fathers of science fiction. That came out of World War One as well. And so there is an actual historical connection between War of the Worlds and H.G. Wells and the Great War. And so that's why I had that in there. But there will be more expansions. And in answer to Jeffrey's uh, question is that, yeah, the ones, the cards I showed are mostly Western Front. But the fact is, I have a lot of Russian cards, Serbian cards, Ottoman cards, uh, Italian cards. In other words, the other fronts are represented in the card bonuses that became stretch goals. <coughs> Those stretch goals succeeded. Those cards will be in the game. And I'm working on historical scenarios for Italy, for the Middle East, uh, for the Eastern Front. Uh, and so those will be available to people on the website. Um, they won't be in the basic game, they'll be shipped out, but the cards will be. In other words, you're going to get everything that happened in the Kickstarter, including the stretch goal cards, but we're going to have more expansions, more historical scenarios, and more cards representing more aspects of like the Portuguese that got into it, uh, the Japanese, etc. Uh, there will be more to put into the game because it's such an enormous subject. All right, I, I hope that gave Jeffrey what he was looking for there. So um, just real quick for folks that may have missed the presentation and need to catch up later on the recording, um, what's the shipping timeline looking like now? <clears throat> so the pre-order store, if people wanna buy the game before um, it's shipped in March, because the game should be going out assembled and shipped uh, by the end of March. If you order at the pre-order store before then, you can get the game with all the stretch goals and everything at the Kickstarter price. Um, and I wanna say that the pre-order store should be active here in the next two weeks. There's only just a couple of things and I have to get it approved by backer kit, which is uh, associated. They're not part of uh, Kickstarter, but they're associated with it. And they're gonna be able to offer add-ons and the pre-order store where people can order the game before it ships at the previous prices. All righty. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions show up in the chat. Uh, we are past two o'clock. I know we started a little late, but we are past the top of the hour at this point. Uh, I think this was a fascinating talk of, of blending the history and then how you were able to incorporate those into some of the cards themselves. Um, as with everything Roger does, it looks great. Um, it's, it's, I can't ever remember something Roger did that didn't look great. So, you know, it's obviously a high standard to uphold and he does it here. So um, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun to finally see when it actually gets to people's tables. It'll be, it'll be neat to see how, how folks react to it. Me too. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I know we had a small group, but that's okay, uh, because I hope that other people uh, get a chance to come and listen to this uh, sometime after the event. Wonderful. And thank you for giving up part of your weekend to come join us here at the, uh, the Armchair Dra Dragoons Digital Convention, um, the ACDC.
just as a quick plug uh, going forward, for those of you watching this after the fact, so this was MLK weekend in January of 2021. Uh, our next digital convention will be coming up uh, this summer. Origins has moved off of their June weekend and gonna try and do an in-person convention in October, hoping that situation has stabilized itself around the globe some that they can pull that off. And so we're going to take over that June weekend with our next digital convention. So. Uh, I believe it's 18, 19, 20, June, whatever the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right around there are. I might be slightly off on the numbers, but that's the, the weekend we're shooting for. And that will be the next Armchair Dragoons digital convention there. So Outstanding. Um, yeah, sir, be sure to let me know. Count me in. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you for joining us, audience. Thank you for popping in. Anybody watching this later on the video, thank you for stopping by and watching it. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch you another time on uh, here with the Armchair Dragoons. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity.